want to uh, take this opportunity to thank Robert for leading us in worship this morning. Uh, Maggie, who normally leads us in worship, is at her grandmother's 90th birthday celebration this weekend. And uh, Robert is a friend of hers, and she asked him to come and lead us in worship. And so we really do appreciate that. And the music was absolutely beautiful. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, this morning we are, uh, today we begin a sermon series titled, We Can Make a Difference. Um, over the course of the next five weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to look to scripture to see how it is that, that we can make a Jesus kind of difference in the world that we live in. Um, over the next five weeks, we'll be looking at a variety of ways that we do that and how that difference comes from our love for Jesus and, and our desire, the desire of all of our hearts to to follow and to take the direction from his word and his ways for how we live our lives and the choices that we make and the things that we do because we know we can make a difference because we are operating and functioning and living under the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. We know that we can make a difference. And we're going to begin by talking this morning about how we can make a difference when we care like Jesus cares when we care in the way that Jesus teaches us to care, which can be considerably different from what the world might could, uh, consider the right way to care. So this morning we're going to talk about caring and the difference that we can make in our church, in our community, and in our world when we care the way that Jesus cares. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your love and your care uh, for us. Thank you, Lord God, that you have rescued us that we can actually say love came down and rescued. Love came down and set us free from sin and death. For these things, God, we thank you. And our prayer this morning is that when we look at your word, um, that we would allow it to really, to really take up residence in our hearts and lives, to really make a difference. It wouldn't just be words that we hear on a Sunday morning and then leave behind as we walk out the doors of the church. Remind us, Lord God, that when we walk out the doors of this church, that is when you need us to care about this world that you've created, about the people who occupy this world. So help us, God, to see and to hear in a way that you would want us and you would have us to see and hear. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I've been thinking a lot about three words um, in preparing for this sermon. Uh, the words are, I don't care. And you know, when you think about it, these words can be really benign in some situations. They're almost sort of flippant when we use them in some situations. And in some situations, they can be really quite disturbing and devastating. Flippantly, we use it because I'll tell you that all across America, on any given day or evening, in living rooms all over this country someone's holding the remote control and they're turning to someone in the room and they're saying what do you want to watch and all across America the answer is given I don't care whatever you want to watch I want to suggest to you that in a couple of hours yes in about two hours from now there will be people getting in their cars and driving all over San Antonio really all over the state of Texas and the question is going to be asked where do you want to have lunch today and all over the state of Texas, the answer is going to be given, I don't care, wherever you want to go. <laughs> Frustrating and annoying, yes. Disturbing and devastating, no. But then there are those times when the words, those three words, I don't care, can have a huge impact on our relationships with one another and really on our relationship with God. I don't care what you think. I don't really care how you feel. I don't care that you're hurting. I don't care that you're struggling. I don't care that you want this marriage to work. I don't care. These can be heartbreaking words to hear. I don't care. And yet, we some of us might not have the actual audacity to say it out loud, I don't care, but our actions show it. 
the way we treat one another, the way that we respond when we hear that there's a need, says, I don't care. So what does caring, what does caring look like? This is what I did this week. I Googled, how do you know when someone cares? Because I do be loving Google. So I, I Googled, how do you know when someone cares? And the results were pretty interesting. Um, some of them that I can tell you um, were, <laughs> were um, well, they ask about how your day was before you ask how their day was. Are they bothered to check in on you? But here's my favorite. Okay, here's my favorite. And this guy's either like a genius or just really funny. But this is what he said. One quick way to find out if someone cares about you is to ask them for money or for a kidney. <laughs> and this is what he says. <laughs> he says, the reaction is priceless either way. It never fails. If you can't get your... Now, here's the thing, though. Here's what... This is what makes this guy pretty, pretty wise. If you can't get yourself to ask for money or a kidney, you'll have to wait until a time when you're completely defeated and see who's still standing beside you, not because they have to, but because they care. Because they care. As Christians, as followers and disciples of Jesus Christ, whose love has rescued us, how does this word care impact our lives and our way of thinking? If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn um, to the New Testament book of Luke. We're going to be looking at chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. If you do not have your Bibles with you, the words can be found printed on the screen. I, I want to invite you to stand this morning as we hear and as we receive the word of God. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus asked. How do you read it? How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the street. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an end and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'm going to tell you that this is a really popular passage in the Bible. It's a pretty well-known passage in the Bible. And a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on the difference between people who were Jewish and people who were Samaritans and how they didn't interact with one another and that sort of thing. But I'm going to tell you that when I read this story, I, I have to wonder to myself why it goes on as long as it does. Why doesn't the conversation just stop at the end of verse 28? And I don't know if that's the mother in me after having raised four kids that wants to say, because I told you so, 
I mean, I don't know if that's what it is or if really, I mean, it should just stop at 28. And here's why. Because the expert in the law comes to Jesus and it says he comes to test him. So the, the, the expert in the law comes to Jesus and asks him a question. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds by asking him a question. How do you read it? What do you know about this? Then the expert in the law responds with his answer. And Jesus says, correct. You got it right. So why doesn't the expert in the law just leave and be like, nailed it? Because Jesus says something after he says, you got this right. He says, now go, and if you do this, go do this, and you will live. You will have eternal life. Jesus adds this now. This is what you're supposed to do. You see, in, 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 in Jewish society in this day and time, there was no difference between, um, between religious law and civil law. I mean, the law was the law, and you kept the law. And Jesus said, this is the law, now go keep it. And so, as we are so inclined to do, it seems to sort of be built into our basic human nature to try to look for the loopholes, you know, to try to figure out the ways to trick and trap and, and find a way out of doing what we're supposed to do. This is what the expert in the law does. He tries to find a way out. Because you know what, you guys, this is a, this is a great question. This is an incredible incredibly valid question. I would say that this is easily one of the most crucial questions that any of us will ever ask in our lifetimes. How do I inherit eternal life? How do I know that there's more than this? How, how do I know that I will have eternal life? This is a crucial, it's not just valid, it's a crucial question. It's Quite easily the most important question you'll ever ask and have answered in your life. Now, I know, uh, because I've done it myself, that, that we put a lot of other questions as really super important questions. You know, at certain stages in life, we have these questions that we want to be sure that we answer correctly. And we make them so, impar so important. You know, who will I marry? Oh, that's a big question. And, you know, like, what will my career be? What will I, what will I do with all of the rest of my life? This is, my, this is going to be my career. Now, these are important questions, but I want to suggest to you strongly today, they're not as important as how do I inherit eternal life. Just for one thing, life is incredibly uncertain. Life is incredibly uncertain, and, and for some of us, some people will never marry, and that's okay. And, and then some people will marry and, and have children and realize that this thing they've been calling their career all their lives can't measure up to the joy and the fulfillment that they feel as a stay-at-home mom or dad. It, it can change. I mean, life is so uncertain that there are people who will not live, to be, live long enough to be married or live long enough to have a career. And so the question we must first answer before we answer any of these other questions is a question that this expert in the law has asked Jesus. How do I inherit eternal life? A crucial question. But even so, there appears to be on the part of this expert in the law an expectation that the answer he receives can be manipulated by him and for him. So this valid question is raised, an answer is given as well as confirmed, and a challenge is then set forth. A challenge is presented. Now, go and do this, and you shall have eternal life. And then there again is that basic condition in our humanness that needs to push, to just push back a little bit to see if, if we can get our own agendas and our own thoughts and our own ideas in there. Because um, you know what? We really know the answers most of the time, don't we? We know what's right. We know what we're supposed to do. But even when we know it, we're sometimes like, yeah, yeah. But I mean, really, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And how can I kind of get out of this? And maybe we just need to say just one more thing. Maybe Jesus hasn't really considered that some neighbors are not worthy of our love. Has Jesus considered that? Or maybe Jesus just hasn't really taken time 
to ponder long enough and actually determine who our neighbors really are. And who better to help Jesus consider these things than an expert in the law? And who better to help Jesus ponder these things than us? How often we spend our efforts looking for the loopholes so that we can excuse ourselves from caring the way that Jesus cares. And what a grand adventure this is in totally missing the point. Totally missing the point. I'm afraid that when it comes to caring like Jesus cares, that many of us want to be simple about it and even apathetic. Do you know that originally apathy was considered one of the seven deadly sins? I want to tell you a little bit about this. The Greek word for this was acedia, and acedia was to neglect caring. It was, an, it was an apathy that was considered a refusal to help others in time of need. The word acedia translated literally means I don't care. I don't care. And so it's a life that says that. It's a life that's like, I, I, you know, I don't care. I know what I'm supposed to do, and I know that there's need out there, but I refuse, and I don't care. I just don't care. When Thomas Aquinas described the Cedia in his interpretation, he described it as an uneasiness of the mind that leads to additional sin. But Dante refined this definition further, and he described the Cedia as the failure to love God with all of a person's heart, soul, mind, and strength. To him, it was a sin characterized by the absence or an insufficiency of love. An absence or insufficiency of love. So when we refuse to reach out in care and concern in the world, when we put more effort into looking for a way out of that than we spend looking for a ways to care, we're really saying, I don't care. And sometimes we have some really good excuses, don't we? Man, we can come up with some really good stuff about why we're not going to do what Jesus calls us to do and commands us to do. Charles Spurgeon said, I never knew a man refuse to help the poor who failed to give at least one admirable excuse. When we care like Jesus cares, that creates in us a love and a concern for others. And that love and that concern overcomes excuses and takes action. And I want to be really clear that I know that we can't do everything. No person can do everything. But we can do something. And every person can do something. We can't fix everything. But we can do something. So this morning I want to ask you this question. How do you read it? How do you read it? And how does the grace of Jesus Christ have an impact on how you read it? How does the grace that's been shown to you and given to you in this life determine how you read this? Let me be really, really obvious. We are saved by grace, not by good works. There's nothing that you or I could do that would really earn us God's favor and God's grace. It's just God's grace, this gift of salvation, God's grace toward us. And God's grace toward us is costly. Jesus died for our redemption, for our sins, for our salvation. It wasn't cheap. And so we must not cheapen God's grace by thinking that we are going to ever be good enough to earn it. But that being said, we must also never cheapen God's grace by taking it for granted or think that we're somehow just entitled to it. And that when we receive that grace, there's not anything really required of us as recipients of that grace. Though we cannot be saved by good works, those of, who are saved will practice good works. Spurgeon also said what the law demands of us, the gospel of Jesus Christ produces in us. Hear that. What the law demands of us, the gospel of Jesus Christ produces in us, wanting us to do good things and good works. Grace produces grace and caring creates caring. So how do you read it? And I'm not saying at all that we should cast prudence to the wind and, and be unwise, to be stupid about how we help other people. I mean, it would be foolish, I mean, really, for a woman to stop and pick up a hitchhiker or even give a man a ride who has a broken car. I have a 21-year-old daughter. I wouldn't give that advice. So I get that there are times when we need to, to be 
wise about how we are, how we are providing help and how we are providing aid. I also understand and I get that we live in a very different world than, than what we're talking about in this scripture, than in Jesus' world. In that day and time, the only needs that people were aware of were those that they personally encountered. And you and I, we know about needs all over the world. We know about flood victims and we know about children starving to death because they don't have food. We know about hurricanes and we know about earthquake victims. We, we're, we're, we have all this information. And so sometimes it might feel like the thing to do is to just throw up our hands and be like, I can't, I can't, I can't. It's not even, I could give every dime I make, every dime I have, and it wouldn't make a dent in the world's need. Maybe that's our reaction to it. It's like, I can't make everything. But again, please hear me say this. We can't do everything, but we can do something. Oh, this past week, uh, all of you know, I like Facebook and Instagram. And so um, I was on Facebook this week and I was reading some different things and I, I found this article about a woman who grew up in this church, who grew up in University United Methodist Church. A and the article said something about, read about the woman who stopped Joseph Coney. And so I, I click on it and I begin to read it. Her name is Shannon Sedgwick Davis. She grew up here. In May of 2010, she flew to South Africa to meet with the leaders there because she had heard about what was going on with Kony, this Ugandan warlord who over the past two decades has abducted tens of thousands of children, children, forcing them to slaughter their own families and friends and then enlisting them in his Lord's resistance army, his rebel army of child soldiers. Now, Shannon Sedgwick Davis, the story is too long for me to tell you everything that's in that article. It was in Christianity Today. I, in, I invite you to read that. In fact, I will post it on my own Facebook wall this afternoon um, for you to read. But since 2012, this Lord's Resistance Army, led by Joseph Coney, the violence has dropped by 93%. In 2013 alone, Coney's army lost the majority of its fighters. Last year brought the biggest return yet in 2014, with more than 500 returnees, including at least 172 women and children. And I want to read a couple of quotes to you from, San, uh, from Shannon Davis. She says, We Americans are dis disproportionately blessed, and we have lived in a fairly peaceful and prosperous time. It is for this reason we have such an extraordinary responsibility. She goes on to say, if I viewed my work through an agnostic lens, I would have a much harder time getting out of bed in the morning. Yes, we have what some might call impossible assignments. But when looked at in light of what I believe about God and the goodness with which we have all been created, those assignments seem worthwhile and achievable and achievable making a difference where the god where the lord god burdens your heart you know when we hear sometimes that a hundred one point I mean, that 1.2 billion people still live in extreme poverty we think there's nothing we can do that many people living on less than a dollar 25 a day just a few months ago 6,000 volunteers walked through these doors and were in this room packing meals, 4 million to be exact, so that 11,000 children would not die of starvation this year. And yet we might feel ourselves feeling somewhat defeated when we know that 2.6 million children die every year as a result of hunger-related causes. And I, I really don't pretend to have the answers to all these difficult matters, but I do know that it makes a difference when we care, that caring makes a difference when we do something. As a result of people caring and acting on that care, progress has been made in these areas. As a matter of fact, there's been a reduction of more than 34% in global hunger since 1990. It's making a difference because people care. And when we personally encounter someone in need, or we hear about someone in need in another country, and the Lord burdens our hearts about that, 
We need to respond as we are able. We need to care like Jesus cares. Love overcomes all the excuses and moves us into compassion and action. There's always something that we can do. We are called to care in the way that Jesus cares and to do something about it. Every time you care enough to do something, to do something, no matter how large or how small it might be, every time you care like Jesus cares, it matters. It matters. It truly does. Shannon Davis said, when we allow ourselves to be present enough to let some of these tragedies take residence in our own hearts, it helps us see all of the places in our lives where we can contribute. The opportunities are everywhere. So this morning I ask you again, how do you read it? Because when you care like Jesus cares, it will matter to someone somewhere and it will matter to Jesus. I believe with all of my heart that San Antonio and the world need a very strong University United Methodist Church to care and to make a difference. And I believe really with all of my heart that Jesus calls us to be a strong presence in our community and in our world.